Alrighty. Hey, just to start, I believe you, your parents were both musically inclined, is that right? Uh, yeah, well, Dad was a, uh, a singer, uh, a, a Welsh choir boy, and Mum was a honky-tonk sort of piano player. Um, and, uh, you know, that used to come out at several parties, and, you know, they'd be sort of singing away and doing their stuff. And, uh, yeah, so that's kind of pretty much the background of it, but... My half brothers and so forth from my mother's uh, first marriage. Um, one of them was musically inclined as well, which was Richard. He was he's like a drummer, mm -hmm. but uh, doesn't follow it anymore. <clears throat> but he was, yeah. So and uh, my eldest half brother's daughter Tina Lyle is a percussion player who uh, <coughs> works with Van Mor Van Morrison. So oh, she's. Wow. Yeah, she's been touring with him for about oh, a lot of years now and been on several recordings, but she actually uh, was with him for this latest bunch of touring, which involved um, the New Orleans Jazz Festival and things like that. So it uh, started probably last November and through to about uh, April, May of this year, I think, yeah. That's awesome. So you remember your first guitar? Uh, yes, it was a gruesome uh, Hofner arch top which in those days uh, probably would have been you know pretty nice guitar supposedly but when I really think back on it then I you know things like action and all that sort of stuff were a struggle for somebody like me because I was just this kid <clears throat> you know so pretty much the same way I struggled with my first guitar teacher <laughs> you know, uh, who was a guy with a sort of a, a shade over his eyes, one of those sort of card playing shades. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, who, uh, in actual fact, strangely enough, presented to me uh, in those days what certainly I remember it being a form of tablature style of play, uh, learning, which, of course, I couldn't make head nor tail of in those days. Um, but, yeah, sort of interesting. Mm. Yeah, Mr. McGuigan, his name was. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about, about your early bands in New Zealand, was there a common musical thread linking linking those bands? Um, I, all I can say is, is that I would imagine that it's just because of the era. Like, everybody, you know, like just got caught up in the whirl of the you know, um, the explosion of music around that sort of early 60s period, you know, it d didn't matter which part of the world, I'm sure, that you were living in, um, and everybody got caught up in it. So from guys that I used to watch at high school at the, at the local socials playing their red strats and stuff like that, through to learning a, uh, how to play, um, a mate of mine who ended up, in a couple of bands that I was in there, uh, Charles Kennedy, or Chaz for short, um, he actually taught me pretty much all, everything I knew about the, the early stuff because he was a guitar player, uh, sort of a young, uh, what would you call it, um, firebrand from those days. He was on the stage when he was 11 playing in variety shows, so he's a pretty good player. And um, so he taught me pretty much of what I know. And, and so consequently, as, as you do... Uh, or, or did in those days like if one band finished and you were fortunate enough you, it didn't take too long before you joined another one you know have you yeah. um you ever stopped to ponder how your your life and career may have panned out had you stayed in new zealand and, and not come across to australia with the rebels um yeah well i mean there there really wasn't much choice um i mean there's only the the, the sort of the, I was involved in the memory and and partly involved myself in the wave of two sort of musical exoduses from New Zealand the first was uh coming out of the days of Dinah Lee Max Merritt Howard Morrison Quartet uh etc cetera, etc cetera. that that sort of era there and a lot of those bands uh and different bands came over prior to me like the Lardy Dars uh, Mike Rudd with his band called Chance R&B, um, etc., etc. They, they came over in the first wave, so sort of late 60s 
and onwards. And then there was the second wave, which involved other bands, you know, like Dee Dee Smash, uh, Dragon, um, Split Ends, etc., etc., etc. So realistically, Australia was the closest place with a burgeoning, you know, sort of pop scene that gave you the opportunity to get out of New Zealand because realistically now even still I think there's just over three and a half to four million people in New Zealand which hasn't changed well sorry it changed when I as I was leaving because most of the uh, a lot of the population were coming to work in Australia Um, and so I think the band thing followed and in those days there were a lot of entrepreneurs in both countries that were sharing uh, the cross Tasman uh, amounts of talent. So, like for example, the first time I saw uh, the Twilights was in 1480 Village in Auckland, in New Zealand, and they did the whole Sergeant Pepper's album and all the sort of stuff that they became famous for. Yeah. Um, so, and the Aussie Pleasers that came over, and so there was a lot of swapping of talent. Of which, one of the bands that I joined later which was originally called Larry's Rebels, they came over and they were actually quite popular in Australia. You know, they were, you know Larry Morris, the singer, was a, a really good entertainer, a front, front man guy. And, uh, you know, they had different coloured suits and pyrotechnics and all sorts of stuff going on. Um, <clears throat> and they came over and then later on in Auckland, um, let's just say um, Larry got uncomfortably detained by the constabulary <laughs> and, and the guys the guys came down to where I, I was playing with, with uh, the band that I was in you know because we were all friends in those days there was a lot more camaraderie I think in music in the old days than there is now but um, uh, they came down and just said oh you know do you want to join our band I said well, look you know I'm kind of happy in what I'm doing at the moment and in answer to your question I'd probably still be there <laughs> languishing somewhere uh, had I not probably even come to Australia with them you know so who, who knows <laughs> <laughs> so was it during that period that you began developing as a songwriter too uh, yeah I'd put a couple of songs together well when I joined the Rebels I'd put a couple of songs together <clears throat> on the Madrigal album that they released over there and um whether I'm ashamed of them uh, or not. Um, I, I mean, when I look back at other bands in New Zealand that were writing at the same time, if I go back to, for exam- example, the Lardy Dars Happy Prince album, uh, I mean, way more mature than anything that I was delivering. Um, so, you know, I, I mean, they, they were just early attempts at what I figured I could, you know, I was doing. Mm. in the framework of the band because the band was sort of, you know, had Mal Logan on keyboards, uh, Viv McCarthy on bass, Snooky Stott on drums and John Williams on guitar. So it was, you know, sort of... um, And when we got to Australia, which was in March of 69, uh, I... Like, we, we were had the first week or so where we weren't doing much. In actual fact, one of the entrepreneurs here, Dennis Smith was in league with our management over in New Zealand, Russell Clark and Benny Levin. <clears throat> and they, uh, uh, Dennis was responsible for sort of pretty much getting us the first bunch of work that we had for that year. And um, anyway, we had a, a week or so of messing around. So, you know, you'd go out to gigs and the guys had been here before anyway without me. Yeah. <clears throat> and um, we went down and we saw Doug Parkinson at, Birdies and and uh, Spectrum at uh, yeah oh God what was the other joint up the top I can't think now um, you know Birdies Sebastian's Sebastian's yeah 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 and I mean after seeing those acts I basically said to the guys look I don't want to play you know kind of what we're doing which was mainly covers you know we were doing if if you remember it would have been around the Stepping Wolf sort of era mm-hmm. so we were doing sort of all that kind of like cover stuff. And I said, I really don't want to do that kind of gear. And I had a passion for a lot of other material myself, um, like traffic and all this sort of stuff. And I just said, oh, I sort of want to play, you know, that kind of music, you know. And so, which I think ultimately probably fragmented the band and that kind of thing. But um, anyway, uh, that's that's kind of where I went with that, you know. Mm. 
Yeah. And then you, you, you found yourself a, a member of Chain there. Well, how did that uh, come about? Well, that was basically what happened. Like the band, but the Rebels busted up, and I was just like free floating, floating around. And of course, at that particular point, you know, I, I, you know, like the other guys, we all had great friends in in the scene in Australia. Uh, as I mentioned, there was a lot more camaraderie then, so you'd be going to parties and hanging out with guys after gigs and all sorts of stuff, you know. Um, and um, I was living, I think, at that point with Bill Putt and his dad, uh, Bill from uh, Spectrum, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and his dad, and um, the guys from Chain just lived around the corner. Uh, and anyway, we, you know, we were all together. Anyway, I was out of a gig and... Um, uh, that's, they just said, oh, do you want to join the band? <laughs> it's like, like a scene out of the Blues Brothers, you know. So like, exactly the same kind of thing. And that's, yeah. sort of, that's sort of pretty much what happened in my entire life, you know, in one way or another. Like it was like that. Uh, um, bands were always looking for, had broken up and looking for other people to slot in and stuff. So you'd go along and have a blow and if it worked out, it'd be great and... If it didn't, it didn't matter, you know. It's, a, it's just one yeah. of those things. But yeah, anyway. So the um, the guys from how did that happen? This is where, unfortunately, for your listeners, um, I won't be able to chronologically put it in order very well because it, <laughs> it sort of it changed rapidly and so, yeah. and so much. But um, how now? How did this happen? Uh, somewhere after the rebels, I, I must have been up in Sydney or something because. I, I did the first open air festival up there at Arimba in Australia, and Chain were one of the lineup, one of the lineups, and that that involved the Chain that that was headed by Wendy Saddington. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> anyway, shortly thereafter, she left, and the the four remaining members went down to to Melbourne, and somehow I was down there. And um, and that's where that occurred because I I got up on stage and jammed with them up there at a river, mm -hmm. so you know don't ask me how it all kind of like <laughs> realistically eventuated because I just can't remember but that that's sort of roughly what happened, and so <clears throat> I was in the band for I don't know a year and a half or something like that, uh, and then that outfit sort of folded and I had no responsibility so I went overseas for about a year and a half and came back and ended up in Darwin just working for a while. And the guys found out... Oh, oh by the way, um, that particular period I was overseas was Chain's most successful period when they had black and blue and yeah. uh, all that sort of stuff. <clears throat> and I came back and the guys found out I was up in, in Darwin. They said, oh, you know, let's get the band back together. So the same lineup that I was involved in, uh, uh, I rejoined... And we did another album and stuff, but I think everybody, had, you know, was moving on musically, and the other guys were so musically more advanced than I was. <clears throat> anyway, it was bound to destruction, so it, it, it sort of like fell apart, uh, and that's when I joined Ariel in, pretty much straight away. And in between those two stints in China, as you said, you're overseas. You spent some time in England. Did did you go over there with any sort of a plan of, of what was what you're going to do over there? Oh, just to, to become incredibly wealthy and famous as a rock star. <laughs> but, no, look, honestly, I had no response. I just took a guitar and stuff over there. And uh, what happened? Um, oh, I just arrived there. I stayed with an ex-Kiwi girlfriend for a while and um, uh, went and tried out with a, a lot of, you know, sort of shelved British... Uh, you know, growing bands, you know, just tried to get a gig. And I found, uh, uh, didn't, none of that happened until I was working a, um, a day gig. And then, as you, as you probably know yourself, like when, when people go overseas, and especially in those days, you know, a lot of the Australians used to sort of crystallise into little groups of people, you know, like you'd go and sort of, Lots of friends would be there. And anyway, I found out <clears throat> through uh, someone... Oh, that's right. I went round to visit Doug Parkinson, who was over there trying to start an outfit called Fanny Adams. Oh, yeah. With Duncan McGuire and, um, and Vince Maloney and people like that. 
Anyway, I just went around to have a cup of tea and everything like that, and they said, oh, look, this friend of ours has just left this band. He's gone to join Ashton Gardner and Dyke, Mick Lieber, the guitar player. And uh, and they said, this small band's got, got, a, got a gig going. Do you want to... You should go around and visit, which I did. And I got there, and in the it was a, a band called Frankie Boy Reed and the Casuals. And Frankie Boy was this Selenese, uh good-looking um, Selenese, uh rock and roll singer who'd had a really big band that used to do the working men's clubs in northern England and stuff with the brass section and all that. And he used to do like Eddie Cochran and early rock and roll stuff. But anyway, the band that I, I fell into was David Montgomery from Python Lee Jackson on drums and, and Tony Carl from the Easy Beats, not playing drums, but playing bass. And Frankie singing and, and here was this guitar. So I just sort of sat in with him for about 18 months and you know um, the gigs were okay to start off with and then the whole thing started to kind of like Frankie was losing gigs and stuff um, and it was just like everywhere you know it was always hard to get a gig and so I just got a job and eventually ended up um, there was a lot of trouble in political trouble in England in those days and in, in the end um, with a lot of the eagle, uh, illegal uh, Pakistanis and that arriving in England, mm. there was all sorts of trouble. You know, there was bombings down in the West End and all, you know, bloody heavy duty stuff. And I just went, no, nah, got to get out of here. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, just hiked, hiked it back to Australia, which is when I ended up in Darwin. Yeah. So, in, in hindsight, is it, do you think it was unsettling for you at all that you never really found yourself in a long term band situation? That, that you, you did um, jump around a few bands? Or do you think it was good because it actually forced you to uh, diversify? Um, well, like I said, for me, I, I don't know what you would even call it. To me, <laughs> to me, it's like it's called survival. Yeah. I think it was like a lot of people, you know, like, and I really didn't have. <clears throat> any other kind of uh, anything to fall back on I wasn't a you know a trained boiler maker or any anything of that type of description um, so music had, had pr- principally been what I'd been in you know from the early Kiwi kind of days and it just happened that I, I knew these people and I think uh, my guitar playing prowess is not the 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 uh, what can I say, the thing that binds it together, it's more my vocals that people have been interested in utilising. Mm. Um, and um, so there was always a position where, you know, a rhythm guitar player and a singer was handy. Uh, I think that's probably how it worked. And <clears throat> But, you know, look, I, I always wanted to be in, in bands and, and my entire career so far as I've been surrounded by incredible musicians of one type or another who've not only taught me a lot but um it's been just uh, you know i wouldn't change anything basically i would i certainly would uh, improve a couple of segments but um i wouldn't i don't think i'd change anything that i've done you know it's somehow just all kind of like dropped out of one and fell into another you know yeah and uh that's how it was you know like it was i got here from from Kiwi land and did that thing for a while and then got into a, a fairly heavyweight sort of progressive you know music blues band as it was then and I, I had a, a little bit of a background in blues because I'd played a lot of it in New Zealand because that was the favoured sort of thing I didn't really kind of the whole sort of pop thing didn't really that starred them so much it was uh, just kind of like the music a lot that I, I enjoyed <clears throat> oh, you know in many of these cases and uh, yeah you know just from chain into aerial from aerial sort of moving on and I had uh, I had uh, in between there there was all sorts of strange couplings of bands that I was involved in you know I had my own um, uh, well not my, oh, yeah I had my own band called uh, Glenn Mason's Loose String Band for a while with uh, different people playing Ray Oliver and Vicky Doland and Michael Hegarty on bass and all sorts of stuff. Um, and I was in a band called Home, which was like a country sort of rock outfit with Trevor Wilson, who was the ex Lardy Dars bass player when uh, when they folded. So there was a whole bunch of stuff. <clears throat> and then as time went on, um, 
yeah, you know, did a did a bit of stuff, played solo, you know, just, uh, the, you know, when when um, a, a few of these outfits folded, <clears throat> there had been a, a kind of a rise in the fact that solo players and things like that uh, were able to get gigs through the agencies because the agencies found them easy to put on before a major act. You know, they didn't have mm. to change the uh, stage landscape or anything like that. <clears throat> and so they could hire somebody like me who was floating around or a thousand others <clears throat> and you get on the stage and you do, you know, 30 minutes of whatever you wanted to do and didn't offend anybody and you just sort of played along and then you just got off the stage real quick and, and uh, the ma- you know, the major band got on. So there was just stuff going on and, uh, you know, really it was a case of staying off the dole queue yeah. you know, and, and, yeah. and being able just to, to keep doing their stuff and so part of that was uh, what I was doing in Melbourne in, you know, let's say 78 or something, which is when Stockley C. Mason got together with Sam and Chris and, and that that outfit, you know. Now, I was going to mention the band Home. I was, actually, I was just listening to that first album this morning. It really stands up well today. Did you have high hopes for that band? Um, probably no more than any other band. I mean, you know, you, you'd, you'd write some songs, you'd lay down some tracks and if you were lucky you had a deal you know that kind of thing uh and then you know if the if the record sort of got there i mean we were playing around quite a bit up in sydney and uh, did the uh, i think an excursion to melbourne and and uh, those things as you could in those days um and then uh um yeah i i, I well, high hopes was that you, you know, hopefully you were going to be able to keep working and yeah. and, and earn some money, and you know, who knows, maybe be a success, you know. But you, you, you can never, you could never tell. So for me, it was like just continuing the musical journey, really. And I guess a lot of it. Yeah. And uh, you know that that came with all of its own responsibilities and and concerns, you know, especially if you, yeah, your relationship took off and you were either married or you had a family and oh shit you know I've got to <laughs> excuse me but you know you got to get a gig or you got to make some money you know etc all of those things apply no matter whether you you know a musician or a or a dishwasher in a restaurant you know what I mean yeah like, yeah it's sure. exactly the same yeah. and the and the arts look the arts has never been like one of those things where I don't know. I mean, I, sure. I think when I was a lot younger, I would have been into the the whole. Oh, you know, got to be like the Beatles and get famous and all this sort of stuff. But later on, the 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 reality of kind of the fact that, as I said, I didn't have any other trade, and uh, the, you know, I kept on playing music, and so I think consequently, uh, all of that just became a, a life journey. You know, it was like, well, you know, this this is what I do, and 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 hopefully I can keep doing it. And but don't get me wrong, I, I've done plenty of other stuff in between the bands. Yeah. And so um, eventually, uh, when I I was uh, I'd been living up in Sydney, and and when the last outfit I was in a a, a soul outfit called Baby Loves to Cha Cha up there, and um, when that folded, because I'd lost my voice twice in in my career at that point. And so the the second time it was like, oh God, you know, this must be a little bit of a signal. I think I'd better just calm down. So I went and worked uh, as a landscaper for a while and I ended up with my own partnership. And then once that folded, um, I, uh, at that particular point, I thought, what the hell am I going to do now? Because that, that was an attempt in trying to just get a straight sort of life going on. Mm. Um, and... Uh, Harvey James was working at Fender Musical Instruments in Australia as a as a rep, and uh, we'd been friends for 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 a long time. And he said, "Oh, there's a gig going at the warehouse." So I went, "Excellent!" You know, because I ended I had a massive debt with the tax department and stuff just because the industry for landscaping fell <laughs> fell into a giant hole the second year. Uh, I was in it uh, with the highest rainfall in Sydney for 42 years, mm. you know, and like massive great concrete companies and people like that just went out of business and millions, zillions of dollars just, and and I just said to my partner, look, mate, here's all my gear, I'm I'm 
bailing out because I've got a mortgage and a wife and um, trying to find a, 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 an easier gig, you know. Uh, anyway, Harvey just said, oh, there's this gig going. So I, I just did stock on Warehouse for a couple of years and then they put me on the road. So I was on the road with Fender for 21 years and so that basically ended the ended that whole journey in playing live in in reality and the only other thing i did during that time was that i had a, a sort of a rehe- a fun rehearsal band because we certainly rehearsed more than we actually played with harvey called um uh, the sons of Don Lane, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, there was Nigel Makara from Tarman and Shad and and, uh, and all that sort of stuff in there, um, and uh, who else was in it? James Rattray on bass, guy called uh, Roger Pike from a band called Daniel. Do you remember them? Yeah, 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 yeah. So and and like that was great fun, you know, and a, and a damn fine band, but like we just couldn't get it enough gigs because everybody in the band was professional doing jobs like Roger was a sort of an architect and Nigel was working at a high quality hi-fi place and blah 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 so you know and and I was doing Fender and so was um, so was Harvey so for some uncanny reason it never never you know we played a couple of gigs around the traps in Sydney and that was that Mm. Just going back to your time in Aero, mm. you joined that band, obviously a band that already had a, a prominent uh, upfront singing and songwriting presence. Yep. When you when you joined, did they put it to you that they were actually looking to uh, add to their singing and songwriting stocks? Um, no, well, to tell you the truth, I'd always liked Ariel from their first orig- original album. And I thought, wow, you know, that, that sort of stuff is like really interesting and, and super stunning. And because I'd been really great friends with Michael and, uh, you know, those guys as I'd gone through the rest of the bands and stuff that I was in, um, I thought, wow, you know, this is just really great and what a great musical band, you know. Mm. And so um, I'm not sure whether they, they did that. And to tell you the truth, I joined the band to play Michael's stuff because my my world was very pop orientated in terms of writing um i certainly didn't write the the left of field kind of gear that michael wrote and um and that's that's what actually interested me to the band um and i i just went well i'm happy doing this and then as, as and I went over to England with them after they'd done rock and roll scars over there etc cetera, etc cetera. Yep. and the band morphed again so uh, when we came back, Harvey left to go to Sherbert. Uh, Nigel was replaced with Ian McLennan on kit. Tony Slavich came in on keyboards. Uh, myself, Bill, and Michael. And all of a sudden, like Michael had three other writers in the band. There was me, Ian, and Tony. Now, to tell you the truth, I, I'm, I'm to this day, I'm not. And don't, don't I, I think we broke Michael's cycle in the terms of the the kind of material that the Ariel was producing, right? And I'm not sure it was the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do. It's just that you know I wasn't capable of writing uh, Michael's gear, and neither were the other two guys. So you know we we had this uh, you know from the albums that came out of that point. I think if you listen to them. Uh, they actually don't have a lot to do with early Ariel, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. And I think it it, it broke the cycle, and I mean, really, uh, that lasted for a couple of years um, that I was in it. Uh, both, and and I think at the end, well, Michael uh, had his own ha- had issues there that came up, which I thought were unfounded and unfair, and that had to do with radio broadcasting at the time um, I don't know whether you've ever had a talk to him but uh, he would be the one to best enlighten you about most of it but radio was not prepared to, to give Michael another, another another shot at it in those days and uh, and the band sort of you know just kind of, sort of came to a grinding halt kind of thing yeah. so you know the, the, his music they, they wouldn't play it on radio um, and 
so there was you know we 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 had a lot of what they call turntable hits so one of the songs that i wrote then it's only love actually became um a highly played turntable hit which meant that djs played it but but like basically a lot of people didn't buy it and uh, so it was quite popular but uh and i wouldn't have said that it increased our live crowds one iota you know so mm. um yeah and the, like the music was changing as you know and, and things uh, the whole world <laughs> kind of <laughs> moved on you know uh, the great billy thought was a huge fan of that song the, oh yeah mm. i don't know that um yeah we i often see um lynn his wife uh, she's a friend of my partner's and and uh you know they, they've become her and Mick Hamilton and stuff, they've become really good friends now. So, But, um, yeah, look, to tell you the truth, I actually, I, I, I'm, I think I met Billy uh, only once in my entire sort of career, uh, so to speak. Um, it's the same with a lot of these famous people. Like, I mean, the, you wave at them across band rooms and things like that if you were supporting them. Uh, but as far as me actually knowing them uh, as a kind of an acquaintance or a friendship thing. I, did, I, I certainly, I probably couldn't name more than about 10 or 15 or so mm. on my hands, you know what I mean, in terms of knowing them, yeah. But, so, uh, I, well, I'm, I'm pleased to hear it. I'm glad you liked it. <laughs> <laughs> now, you had your loose string band and then you teamed up with uh, with Chris Stockley and Sam C. That turned out to yep. be quite a, quite a successful period for you, didn't it? Yeah, well, uh, it was only about really about 18 months from my memory but the first year of the band was an absolutely stellar year and we had John Blanchfield as management and um, we were a lot more country uh, than rock when we first started so you know Chris was playing a lot more mandolin Sam was playing lap steel and, and a whole bunch of stuff and so with stars off the road and Richard Clapton off the road that sort of cross countryish pop sort of thing um, we had a almost an open channel and because we rocked our asses off it, it, it basically that first year became and like you know we we worked unbelievably um, like you know we just at one gig here in Melbourne we did 52 gigs in the year at the Prospect mm. Hill Hotel so we were working five or six gigs a week non-stop so we, were, we became incredibly tight and very sort of well known, and certainly down here in Victoria, I have to add, uh, but no, not much elsewhere. Yeah, but um, look, great band, loved it all, and um, you know, but it, it, it reached this point where we we sort of kind of were our own worst enemies. We got to uh, do a live album, which became legendary, along with a movie that we made which incorporated a lot of the music on the album yep. and the both was supposed to be simultaneously released which also never came to fruition and um so that that drifted off into to uh, legend land and um the band folded um because we got to a point where we should have been recording and making another album and because we'd been working so hard we forgot to leave time to make music and uh and that therein lay the problem and so the band sort of floundered and um yeah just uh, dropped off and so that was 78 to about 81 or so um i think that was it yeah something okay. like that you was, I guess you were certainly helped along by a very buoyant live music scene at that, that time. I mean, there were venues everywhere. Look, in in my entire life uh, up to that point, that's how it had been. I think that's what helped in me, uh, de sorry, de describing to you um, w how that scene was so healthy. And I think I was lucky that I managed to exist in a healthy scene, if you get my drift. Mm. So bouncing from bands to bands wasn't a problem because that that other band that I knew was also working and so were like 50 others and Melbourne like I walked into a scene in Melbourne in 69 that was like amazing I think there was something uh, a friend of mine who's my next door neighbor Rob Greaves who writes some uh, articles and stuff for Turak Times and a great musicologist uh, he's done an article on the gigs 
in Melbourne that existed around that time. And I, I, I honestly can't remember the number, but it was a lot. You know, there was like 60, 70, possibly even more gigs surviving and pulling in massive crowds uh, and supporting work for hundreds of bands uh, at that time and did so like right up until, I don't know, somewhere, somewhere around the mid-80s. So it was bloody amazing. Mm. <laughs> and I, I grant myself being fo- incredibly fortunate to have, have had that time, you know, yeah. So in hindsight, would that be one of your big regrets that you didn't get a, a more opportunity to, to, to actually record with, with the Stock VC and Mason? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, uh, you know, it was, it was um, around about that. Uh, time what actually sort of happened um, the uh, what happened with Stockley so I can't bloody remember now um, we may have just tried to uh, it's, we tried to get like another deal uh, after we'd done that first album and um, the record company that w- w- approached us uh, there's something along the lines that, um, well, why don't you get Daryl Braithwaite to sing up front and we've got this ready-made fantastic band. And so, I, I, hey, it didn't certainly didn't bother me and I thought it was a great idea. So we did a whole bunch of demos and it got to the end of the demo making uh, with, you know, fabulous quips about how much money they were going to put towards recording for us and all this sort of stuff. And then Daryl was still tied up, so that whole segment floundered, and we tried to find another singer, which the you know um, uh, we we found some guy, great range and a good singer. But by that time, the budget for the record company was floundering on into the next year, and they said, "Oh well, no, we haven't got enough money this year." Basically, sort of you know just saying thanks, but no thanks, and see you later, guys. Mm. So, so that's kind of like what happened uh, to Stockley C. Mason that I was involved in. <clears throat> so I, I, so I, I left around about that time, I think, from my memory. I honestly can't remember how it all sort of came together, and I don't even know if it, that was at the same time after the the band floundered when I was I was involved. I can't remember whether I left and came back, and that was another thing that was put to us. You know, I, <laughs> the, a lot of the uh, can continuum for me just uh, my brain doesn't pick it up very well these days but Sam C my partner who I still like work with in the duo and the trio that, that I do um, he, he's got a, a better memory of thing how that continued on because he continued the, the existing Stockley C band on for a while uh, which had I think Joe Embrol on bass at that stage uh, Dave Stewart on kit Chris and himself from my memory I, I honestly can't remember how it sort of all kept on going but he did that for a while yeah now you mentioned those years you, you spent working for Fender did you miss the stage during that time um, uh, not really because I was working too too hard uh, yeah. but you know I ended up taking over half the, there was only two reps at the time uh, and uh, so Harvey was, uh, you know, shifted his territories down to down south. Uh, I was taking over the northern sector for a while, so I did sort of basically uh, h- half of the country, and he did the rest. And then it became uh, Fender was doing incredibly well in Australia then, and uh, became necessary to put on more staff, and so the territories were broken up a bit. But I was still. We were all still working like absolute Trojans. Um, so Harvey left Fender in Melbourne uh, to do other other things. And so I took over down south, which basically meant all the territories south of Sydney uh, and the states, including Western Australia and Tasmania. So realistically, I was fortunate to be in an industry that I knew something about. Um, and most of the guys that I would run into were either behind the shop counter in some shop where they'd occasionally roll in. So it was a good gig for an ex, ex-musician, so yeah. to speak, you know. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'd get up and yell and scream at the occasional workshop, you know, for Fender and things like that. But the the aspect about trying to get something together, which I explained earlier in, in our discussion, was uh, like band, like, um, you know... Um, 
the sons of Don Lane just couldn't make it because I was working too hard. You know, you'd, you'd come back into the guys at a rehearsal and say, oh, listen, mate, you know that gig that we had lined up for three weeks uh, in the future? Well, I can't do it. I'm down in Tassie, you know. And that was kind of like what happened with everybody. Roger yeah. would walk in occasionally and say, look, mate, I'm sorry, I've got to go over to Thailand for two weeks to set up the entire interior on a hotel. You know, so, and what are you going to say? You, 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 you know, you can't stop how that goes. And yeah. so that, that, that just became how it was. So, no, I, I, look, I, I didn't, look, I, I, I suppose I missed playing in one aspect, but um, in, the, in the other one, it gave me the opportunity to have a regu- regular income. Uh, you know, I was involved in buying a couple of houses, that that sort of stuff, you know, that gave me the opportunity to live a different type of life, you know. And I was married at that point, and so, we, you know, we just you just do building blocks in another area, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, you've been working with Sam C again in recent years. What What is it about Sam that makes him a, a great musical partner for you? Um, well, I think... If I if I have to lay this down, uh, I think Sam's probably one of the most underrated full total musicians in Australia, because not only is he adept on other instruments like piano, lap steel, uh, you know, he sings, he writes his own songs. He's an accomplished uh, sort of producer, uh, come home engineer, because he he he'd be the first to say well look you know I don't know that much but he spent the last 15 to 20 years developing what he does know about production and I reckon he's damn fine at it um, I think for Sam he's got probably one for me personally working in a duo and, and, and playing music with him he's got a really great uh, knowledge of of all forms of music and musical ear so that when he comes to contribute to any song that like I might write or whatever it might be somehow it's sort of he seems to be able to know exactly what what's required in it and never overplays his ear tell you know he's really great with sounds like I, I like sort of western swing stuff right so I've written a couple of songs that have a vague thing on that so he comes up with these sounds and guitar lines and stuff that just <laughs> sort of kind of like make it happen so you know that I, I think that's his overall greatest strength he's got that that total ability to to do that sort of stuff and we just we get on great and we have a lot of fun when we play and you know for me these days I mean <clears throat> I'm not in the, in there to make a, a well I certainly wouldn't mind more work and more dollars to to hit the patty but that's probably um I don't think that's different than any other people that, that I know that are in the same realm as what I, I'm at right now. Mm. You know, we're all existing, we're all playing a few gigs if you if you you know, you still enjoy it and you can put a few licks together. And I think that's you know, and he's 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 the greatest asset on that because as I explained very early, I'm a singer and a bit of a guitar player but he's the consummate musician. Like, he yeah. pl- he seriously knows how to play. So to have him there at, at, at my at my side um, doing all that stuff is friggin' amazing because I can't do it. Uh, <laughs> you, you know what I mean? Like, if I yeah. was a solo guy like Tommy Emmanuel, uh, you know, the, uh, I'd be uh, that kind of guy. But I'm not. I can't play like that. I, you know, and so... <clears throat> To have other musicians around me has always been a great pleasure, and I like the idea of other voices, uh, like when we play in the, the trio, Lindsay Field from Farnham's, uh, you know, who's an awesome talent on his own, but a great singer, and and to have those guys around and contributing harmonies and stuff like that, I've I've always enjoyed that that whole sort of blend of. Um, voices and, and instrumentation and stuff that can happen when you're working with other people um, and I've never ever once uh, I've had to play solo because it was a way of making money so I could put rent and food on the table but did I enjoy it I hated every minute of it mm. um, so uh, th- when it, when I work with other people 
Um, it's and Sam and I and Lindsay, we've got a blend in vocals that works. Uh, Sam and I have got a, a, a sort of a thing together because we've been working together for so long now that I think it, it's it's something that people enjoy, obviously, because some, some of the crowd have been following us for about bloody, I don't know, since about 2000 or so. So, um, you know, obviously it, it kind of tricks along and we've got a couple of albums out. I haven't written songs for a long time because <clears throat> Sam and I have also been involved in other projects. Like we've been out with Brian Cowd and Glenn Shirek working in their backing band uh, for the last five years on and off. So that sort of puts things like the partners and songwriting to one side. And besides the fact that I'm not the most prolific songwriter that's hit the earth and I'm, I greatly envy all those magnificent people like Neil Finn, uh, you know, who can just come up with these incredible songs and incredible albums uh, somehow continually, <laughs> <laughs> you know, which which just boggles my mind, you know, like I just sort of, you know, and obviously I know that people who do that work at it, you know what I mean? Like yeah. that's that's what they work at. And I'm either a lazy son of a gun or whatever the thing is, but I just can't do that. So, and I can't write songs on the road either. I've never been able to do that. So um, it's slow but sure. I've got you know a few musical ideas that I come up with, but uh, we just haven't had time. Uh, well, I would say that despite the fact that that we get together for rehearsals and everything, um, we've had other projects. Uh, Sam's come up with another one uh, year, must be nearly two years now um, called Down Under the Covers where we take a whole bunch of Australian songs and we change the arrangements uh, include three part harmonies and blah 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 and Sam's a really great arranger at that stuff and so that that was a complete exercise in trying to make some friggin dollars you know because it's so hard trying to trying to keep that side of it together you know um, and there you go. <laughs> that's, that's kind of that brings us into the the current era, so to speak. Absolutely, and and with, with the trio now with Lindsay and doing those Australian covers, yeah, have you got a criteria of song choice? The, what makes a song just right for the for your treatment? Uh, well, it, even that proves to be quite difficult because there's so you'd you'd automatically turn around and go, I'd love to do a hundred of these great Aussie songs, of which there are just over thousands of them. Mm. Uh, however, they don't always work in our format because we only we don't use other instrumentation. There's three acoustic electric guitars going through amplifiers in the PA, and there's three voices. And we try to do our own arrangements of those songs because if you... Tr like, there's a zillion tribute and cover bands out there and we just don't want to be those. That that we we agreed that when Sam came up with the idea that you know the last thing we wanted to do was to be a straight out covers band because half of the songs that you would cover are done by tribute bands in Australia that do them amazingly well. Like there's Eagles covers bands, there's In Excess covers bands, there's ACDC covers bands, there's you know any any cover band that you would like is probably pretty much uh, covered in Australia, mm. okay? Yeah. And we just went, well, I, I just went, if I play in, in another cover band ever, uh, I, I don't want to do it. Uh, I just couldn't do it because it becomes incredibly boring and, and that doesn't mean they're not great songs. Uh, so we try to, to, to still be uh, uh, have integrity in the music, but we like I just don't you know we all we all, the three of us don't want to play in another straight ahead covers band mm. like it's got to have some kind of difference to it so no what what you're doing is is more in, about interpreting the songs rather than straight out covering them correct yeah 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 yeah, yeah. yeah. you can sit at home and like I can keep myself happy by trying to learn something off the off the off the uh, internet or something if I wanted to. But um, we, so when we get together, we'll we'll try and work out a, a some walls. It's mostly Sam because he's a great arranger and knows how to put that shit together. And mm -hmm. so we we um, we try to uh, listen to the song. We see if it can work both rhythmically and melodically. 
uh, and then if it can, we'll give it a damn good thrashing. But if if it can't, uh, sometimes we you know we could spend a couple of days on it and then just go, no, nah, this ain't working, you know. And uh, and a lot a lot of that's to do with the instrumentation and stuff, you know, because you're you're trying to cover bands that have got like you know five six instruments in them and keyboards and friggin' bass and drums and everything else and you just go well you know and i i've just got a stomp box so we've got ourselves a kind of a, a basic bottom end rhythmic content and then everything yeah. else sits on top and then we we'll take the, the the vocal arrangements in there and see if we can ch- you know change any of it uh all that kind of stuff we you know we we keep faith with the original melody most of the time we'll try to and generally, once you're into the song, most people recognise it and that kind of thing. So, anyway, that's that's kind of what we've done to try and sort of, um, you know, keep the ball rolling, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> and just before I let you go, Gwen, yeah. um, what's in your books for the rest of the year? Uh, upcoming plans? Uh, well, I suppose that we've been involved because of our connection with Brian Cad and Glenn. Uh, Marius Ells, who was their full management at one particular point, he runs an agency out of Sydney, for years has been involved in uh, uh, collecting and, and, and putting talent through to the Royal Caribbean line with the Rock, Rock the Boat cruises. Oh, yeah. Uh, mostly the, most of them come out of Sydney, his, his particular thing. Anyway, Marius has become one of the triad of the actual o- operator owners of, of that title, and be, he was, uh, because of his link with those guys, he came on a tour as pretty much a tour manager for Brian before Brian shifted to America again about a year and a half, two years ago. And um, he said to us on one of these tours, he said, oh, um, would you guys, Sam and I, he said, you know, do you, would you be interested in going on one of the boats? Uh, you know, and we said, well, we're amazingly available, so... Uh, <laughs> You know, uh, of course. So about five years ago, I think 2016, I think, um, was the, one of the first ones we did. And around about that time, we'd actually started getting this rock, uh, the the trio together. So away we went on the boat, um, and uh, it was it was successful for us in the fact that they liked us, and so did the crowd obviously which gets through to the entertainment management of the cruise line um, anyway so from there on in <coughs> we're now on our, on our fifth I think it's fifth or sixth cruise uh, this this October coming next month so we're doing that with uh, I think Susie Quattro's headlining and da 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 um, and there's always quite a good contingent of Aussie talent on the boat so um, yeah but I, uh, we don't know how, how how long this whole thing will tickle along, but once a year it's just been absolutely fabulous to, to do them. I think we didn't we're not doing next year, but who knows? That that's totally in Marius's hands and stuff. And, but we enjoy it, and you, you can um, and and the camaraderie on board with the musicians and stuff really exists. Um, we're usually on land. You totally separated by miles and time and everything and you and you very really get into that situation where there's a whole bunch of musos hanging out together you know yeah, yeah. so it's great fun and the people who get on the boat are just uh, so fa- fabulous because they're there for the music that's why they come on the boat mm. there's none of this oh well, we're stepping off at some exotic destination in in the Caribbean or elsewhere, we're here because we're here for the music, all the all the bands, and we love it, and we want to just enjoy it, and and so it's a, it's a great atmosphere, I have to say, it's just fabulous. Uh, so <clears throat> we enjoy that, and you can sell a few CDs, and you know just um, kick around and have some fun. Awesome, it's really good. So anyway, that's there, uh, and we'll just pursue and continue on with uh, our world in trying to get gigs. Um, the trio becomes a little bit more difficult because Lindsay's t- t- tied up, as he has been for the last 35 or however many years, with John Farnham. So the moment John sort of gets gigs and stuff these days, which is uh, one of the uh, things about this particular boat, um, he's uh, he's um, ducking off mid-cruise from Noumea, uh where he's getting a plane back to Aussie and over to Singapore to sing with John. So um, luckily we would have done the Field Sea Mason stuff on the boat by then, 
and so Sam and I get on with the partners and, and we're also playing with uh, Glenn and uh, Brian on the boat in their show. Uh, they have two shows on the boat, so we're playing in that as well, which um, gives us uh, the chance to actually do that. So, uh, yeah, there you go. Fantastic. Well, busy times ahead. Yes, here we are. <laughs> hey, Glenn, thanks for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure catching up with you. Thanks for being so generous with your time. Oh, look, mate, it, look I, it, I, I think most musicians, uh, and particularly of, of our, my vintage, love getting together uh, with like, like-minded like people like yourself. You obviously enjoy this, and, and thanks so much for having me on. I appreciate it greatly. And the, and the, I think most musicians love to, to have a rap and, and talk about it because there were some uh, amazing times, and I'm, I'm uh, in the words of Delbert McClinton, I certainly am one of the fortunate few who, <laughs> lived, who lived through those moments. And, and just, as I said, I'd do it all over again just with a click of the fingers you know I, I wouldn't have I would do things probably on a couple of occasions slightly different but outside of that um, I lived through it and, and I'm uh, you know it's just been awesome <laughs> yeah. for want of a better word no, absolutely congrats on an outstanding contribution to Australian music and being yeah. one of the great team players in Australian music uh, well again you know I'm thankful for it all and thankful to everybody who's contributed to my life in that because uh, I've worked and lived with some of the best uh, so yeah there, I'll end it there it's just awesome <laughs> fantastic thanks again Glenn I'll let you enjoy the rest of your day okay mate thanks John all appreciate the best. it all the best Cheers. Bye. bye bye